In a 2006 article of Good Housekeeping entitled Five Things People Really Notice, uh, this article dealt with the things that people particularly notice from the moment they stepped inside of your house that would leave a bad impression, a lasting impression on them, and how you could fix it. The five things that most guests noticed when they entered into our homes were, number one, piles of mail. So they said, keep an empty drawer in the kitchen for your correspondence. Number two, dust bunnies and cobwebs. So use a broom and a vacuum weekly. Uh, number three, a messy bathroom. Use glass cleaner for the mirror and other handy cleanup aids for the floors and appliances. Number four, dirty dishes in the sink. Throw them in the dishwasher or rinse and place them in the oven. Number five, bulging waste baskets. So empty the trash into a larger receptacle that can be kept out of sight. See, these are typical things, but they have a lasting impression with some people on the type of person you are, whether they're signs of a disorganized, messy person or maybe something more serious, such as stress. But you know, Paul gives a list in the book of Galatians uh, that are not only things that can leave a lasting bad impression on those who know us, but ultimately affect our relationship with God. And what they indicate is something so much more serious, the condition of our very soul. Last week, we talked about what it means to walk by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, to live a lifestyle pattern and in step with the Spirit's guiding word. Paul's going to give a list of attributes later in Galatians chapter 5 to what it looks like when a person is walking by the Spirit, and he calls them the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. But before that, he gives a list of things that are demonstrated by a person who's not walking by the Spirit, but produces the works of the flesh. So if you have your Bibles, I want us to go ahead. We're going to begin reading in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to read verse 19 through 21, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21, and it reads, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sor sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the context. After the churches were planted in Galatia, a group of false teachers began to corrupt the congregation, teaching them to abandon the gospel that Paul taught them, uh, and, and which everyone came, uh, that, that the message of everyone that can come to Christ. See, these false teachers replaced the teaching, saying that unless people became Jews first and obeyed the old covenant outwardly, they couldn't follow Jesus. So Paul wrote this letter to the Galatians to lay out the distinctions between what is true and what is false, between law and grace, between faith and works. Now, the final two chapters of, how, of this letter is a how-to guidebook, the difference that the gospel makes in a Christian's everyday life and what it should look like in our lives. See, it was obvious and shocking to Paul that the Galatians struggled to see the distinction between what Christianity truly was and what it truly wasn't. And he said earlier in this book, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel there in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. But just as we talked about last week, see, the difference is impossible without walking in the Spirit. A Christian can't live the Christian life by one's own resources any more than he could or she could save themselves by their own resources. To try to live apart from the Spirit's guiding word, the Bible, is, as Paul points out, as we studied last week, fulfilling the desires of the flesh. So what Paul does in this next section we just read is he shows what that would look like. He's saying, y'all think you're walking in the Spirit? Does it look like this? And what he does is he holds up a spiritual mirror for them and for us to look and to see if we're truly living life in the Spirit. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident. In other words, he's saying, it's obvious if you're not walking in the Spirit. There are key attributes. There are key markers. There are things that are obvious of the flesh, sinful action of human beings who put their own selfish needs ahead of everything else. You know, the CDC and, and the WHO has given physical markers of what may be symptomatic of coronavirus. WebMD, the hypochondriac's worst friend, gives a host of symptoms that may be indicative of many different ailments. Paul, in this passage, gives the symptoms of the most destructive illness man has, and that's sin. He puts sexual immorality on this list. See, in the world that Paul and the Galatians lived in, sexual immorality was not only condoned, but was regarded as an essential part of everyday life. 
Greek mythology and their cult worship, as well as the Roman government, revealed and promoted sexual immorality, adultery, fornication, incest, prostitution. Women in the ancient world were not regarded as human beings. They weren't on the same standing as men, but as objects to please men. And this idea was so pervasive that there's a sizable amount of the New Testament that deals with rebuking this worldview. As a matter of fact, there was a slogan in this time period, uh, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. In other words, this was a slogan that promoted excess and indulgence. Whatever you crave, even if it's not good for you, then have it. Sexual morality was up there. This is why Paul in 1 Corinthians 6.13 says the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now the next work of the flesh that he indicates is impurity. The word he uses here in the Greek was used in various ways, one of which was uh, the pus of an unclean wound. Impurity, in this case, is what makes people unfit to come before God, the contamination with the things that separate us from him. This is why Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. That word for pure comes from the same word that we get, cathartic, or to remove that which is causing pain, illness, uncleanness. Why are the pure in heart blessed? Jesus says in Matthew 5, 8, for they shall see God. Paul then says sensuality in this list of works of the flesh. That word is defined as readiness for any pleasure, to not have restraint whatsoever, impulsivity and given into the desires rather than what's right. It's like what Paul describes when he says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19 about those who set their minds on earthly things. He says their God is their belly. They only seek to please themselves. Another work of the flesh that Paul indicates is idolatry. See, in this day and age, we get the visual of statues of Zeus, Aphrodite. But idolatry at its core is feeling about something the way we should feel about God. It's trusting in something or someone to do something only God can do. It's maximizing things and minimizing God. See, the idols we devote for ourselves can be anything. They don't have to be made of wood of stone. They can be possessions, status, people, family, friends, power, politics, social movements. Most of these things are not bad things, but are gifts from God. But an idol could be anything that we think we need to make our lives better, happier, and give us meaning. That's God's place. How can you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, when that's all going to someone or something else? Paul also lists in this list sorcery. This one's interesting. See, I usually brush right by it because I think of cartoon magic, you know, bippity boppity boop, Mickey and Fantasia, things like that and, and whatnot. But this one goes a bit deeper. See, in the ancient world, witch doctors, shaman, they would use intoxicating hallucinogenic drugs to alter the behaviors of others as a spell or a curse. It was an ancient form of drug abuse. The practice of this was called pharmakeia, and that's the same word that we use today for pharmacy, the sorcery. And that part of the world, though, was not meant for anything else but for the control of a cult. Paul continues in this list with enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. We've seen a lot of this in our news lately, right? Whether they be in politics, whether they be on social media, hostility, animosity. When people reject God and a life walking in the spirit, they turn in on themselves and relationships between human beings are destroyed in the process. This idea describes a state of mind towards other people that places a barrier between you and them. There's no dialogue. There's no empathy for the other side, even if you don't agree with them or, or much like them. It's the opposite of agape, the opposite of love. It's the opposite of God because God is love, right? 1 John 4, 8. The prophet Isaiah describes Jesus Christ as the prince of peace. And if you're a peacemaker, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9 that you are also called a son of God. In other words, you're just like your father. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18 through 21, he says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself and counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, that you, excuse me, that in him you might become the righteousness of God. See, those who walk in the spirit apart from are, are part of that ministry of reconciliation. Those who are of the flesh are the complete opposite. In Galatians 5.21, Paul adds to this list. He says, envies, drunkenness, orgies. Envy comes from a heart that is not content with what God has given them. Desiring rather what God gives to others to the point of hate. The Greeks called it the greatest of all diseases. 
It's an indicator of a corrupt mind that has denied God as, as Paul describes in Romans chapter 1 and verse 28 through 29. Drunkenness in the ancient world was viewed as the thing that turned people into animals. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Orgies or carousing, as some translations put, uh, were unrestrained revelry, a party that has degenerated and is out of control till it becomes a celebration of all that is wicked. But Paul says in this verse, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do these things, such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. When he says such things, he's saying that this list is not all-inclusive. We're going to struggle with sin. John, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But you see, there's a big difference between struggling, combating with sin, getting up when we stumble, and settling into a lifestyle of sin that it becomes so habitual. These sins that are listed are meant to give us a basic idea of what the works of the flesh look like. Just as Paul described life in the spirit as a walk, a pattern. These things, they don't just happen in a vacuum. They're habit building because it all begins in the heart. These patterns, they indicate there's a spiritual sickness and the only cure for that is living by the spirit, the word of God. Paul would say in Romans 12, verse 2, to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of our minds, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable and perfect. You know, the Galatians, they struggled with discernment, what was true, what was false, what was right, what was wrong. See, the Spirit's word is the guide to that. The Hebrews writer would say in Hebrews chapter 4, and verse 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and spirit of joint marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 through 2, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn infants long for the spiritual pure milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. See, the end of the result of a life that produces works of the flesh is loss of that beautiful inheritance he's laid up for us. Christ died so that we may live. Christ gave up the glory of heaven, came down to this earth so that you and I might be made rich, as Paul told the Corinthians. That's why he came. So that you and I don't have to suffer any longer with a life of sin. We don't have to suffer any longer in a life that had no hope. We don't have to suffer any longer trying to carry a burden that we can't truly carry stumbling and struggling to even lift it up. We couldn't do that on our own. That's why he was lifted up for our sake. But just as the way Paul writes in Ephesians, you know, he says, uh, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us in that while we were, he says in that while we were still sinners, he made it or rather in that he, he says that we were made alive together with Christ, excuse me, by grace we've been saved there in Ephesians chapter two and verse four. Grace is an amazing thing. And when we walk in the Spirit, we're those who have been transformed by the grace of God. But Paul would say there in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, shall we continue in sin? In other words, shall we, just like the way Paul's describing here, should we walk in a pattern of sinfulness so that grace may abound? In other words, taking advantage of what he's done for us, taking advantage of that love and that mercy and that compassion. Because let me tell you, if we live that lifestyle, if we walk in a manner that is far from the spirit, we walk in a manner that is close and clinging to the flesh, we will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is the biblical truth. And it's easy, it's easy, honestly, to look at this list of stuff that we just went through and say, okay, well, you know, sexual immorality, I don't do that one. Um, Yeah, I struggle with my temper, but you know, it's not a big deal. It's easy to look at this list and say, okay, these are worse and these are, no, he puts them in that list and he says, look, This is the type of lifestyle that a person is living if they're not a part of the Spirit. And just because you may not be struggling with drug addiction doesn't mean that your volatile temper or your issues with envy or jealousy are minimized in the eyes of God. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the light as he is in the light, right? Isn't that what John says? Follow Jesus Christ. Use his guiding word. How can a young man keep his way pure? The psalmist says in Psalm 119, by guarding it according to the word of God. Walking by the Spirit, the 
you know, I say the symptoms of walking in the flesh, Paul gave the signs that we're healthy, that our spiritual functions are functioning properly. We're going to look at that next week. I love you guys. Uh, right now, this camera angle is different than what we've uh, typically had. Uh, the reason why is because we're testing. I'm testing it out today just to see uh, how it's going to look for uh, when we meet again on July 5th. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I love you guys a lot. I can't wait to be back in the building together. Uh, and I pray, I can't wait till the day that we can officially, completely uh, meet together again. But I'm also so thankful to God for your patience, for his patience with us as well, as well as uh, the fact that we're able to even do what we're doing right now. Love you guys. God bless. I pray that you have a good rest of the day.